Nope, we don't need to speed up the process. We don't need to nuke this. You know why? Because this is the non-microwave truth. I am CL Whiteside, and this is brought to you by Time of Grace Ministry. Before we get into our episode today, I want to go back to a couple episodes ago where I asked the first world problem question of what's a tricky question in the Bible? What's a tricky question that deals with something in the Bible? And I got some feedback, but one of the tricky questions that someone posed, it, it jumped out to me. And this was on YouTube, and this came from Aqua8697. And their tricky, tricky question was, are married couples only supposed to have sex to try to have kids? And the reason they said this is because they had heard somebody mention this, that like, the only time you're really supposed to engage in sexual relations is if you're trying to have a kid. And they refer to Genesis chapter 38. Now, I'll tell you off top, God gifted married couples with sex. It, it can be pleasurable. It can be something that you can just do to have a good time and have fun when you're married. When you're married. You say, well, where do you get this from? Uh, if you want to check out Proverbs 5, verse 15 to 19, or you can check out Song of Songs, chapter 4 and 5. I think that's like some baby making music or, or wording. But you go read that for yourself. Now, going back to Genesis chapter 38, this is a unique uh, portion of scripture because it's like it talks about the life of Joseph. It cuts and takes a break and it brings us to Onan. And then it talks about the story of Joseph again. But going back to Genesis chapter 38, the story or a dude named Onan is he had a brother. His brother died. His brother was married. Now, they didn't have any kids. So it was the responsibility of the brother-in-law, and he did have a choice to, to marry his sister-in-law. But the rule was, all right, if you marry her, the first child, the first son that she has is going to have your brother's name. So if you're going to do this, you got to understand that the first son is going to have his name and you need to marry her. And that 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 law gets broken down to us in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 through 10. Now, Onan, he heard, all right, we supposed to have a kid. That means we get to have sex. And if that means we get to have sex, that's pleasurable. But he didn't take her as his wife. He just kept hitting and having sex. Now, when you read this, this is one of those things in scripture you might read a couple of times. Like, he did what? It says that he would spill his semen on the ground. So that means he used the pullout method. He did. He made sure he did not ejaculate in this woman because he didn't want her to have a child. So he was only using sex for pleasure when he really wasn't even married to her. So that's why he ended up dying because it was like, bro, this is wicked. The Lord was like, this is wicked. So you are going to die because of this. So to answer your question, yep, you can definitely, when you're married, have sex for pleasure, but he was manipulating that law big time. And again, that law is in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 through 10. Go read about that. And I'm going to make sure I put that in the notes as well. And then the passage or the portion of scripture that this person was referring to was Genesis chapter 38. And it's like he had a choice. Deuteronomy 25 makes it interesting to see what his choice would have been if he didn't want to. But he didn't have to say, yeah, I'll I'll do this. But he wanted to to roll around in the mud and stay clean, too. And you just can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. Now, let's get into our first world problem question. First world problem question is this. What is the worst name that you have been called as a Christian or a person who's following Jesus? What is the worst name that you have been called? You got that name in mind. Like, I really couldn't think about a name or something that someone's really even called me. The closest thing that I could come up with is that someone saying, you know what? You take the Bible way too literal. And I'm like, in a way, that's kind of a compliment. But I want to hear from you. What is the worst name that you have been called for following Jesus for being a Christian? We'd love to hear from you. Instagram or Twitter handle is Champion Life 23. You also can hit me up on TikTok or leave the comments on YouTube. And this is our first word problem. It is dinner time. The title of our episode today is, oh, so that's what you calling it? In our culture, in our society, so many times, we think that switching up the name or changing the name can make something more appealing or make it more attractive, make it not seem as bad. 
sometimes we flat out just do it to deceive people. And I was talking to someone who tunes into the podcast, shout out to Candy, and he sent this video where it was this pastor talking about how our world, the enemy has tried to change the name of certain sins to make it seem not as bad. And that's just something that the enemy has always tried to do. He wants to, first of all, hijack everything, but then he also wants to make it seem like it's not bad. And we don't even want to use that word sin, or we don't want to use certain things that clearly be in the in the Ten Commandments. Like, no, I don't, we're going to call it something else. So I'm just going to read some of the examples that this pastor got. This pastor was, he, he was doing his thing. This, this was good. So some of the examples that he used were like, we don't want to call it sexual exploitation. We want to call it adult entertainment. We don't want to call it pedophilia. We want to call it minor attracted people. We don't want to call something like cheating or adultery. We'll say like, oh, that's an open marriage or, or, or they're swinging. We don't want to call it mental illness. We'll call it gender dysphoria. We don't want to say gender mutilation. That's because that's like cutting off your body parts and all that stuff. That sounds really bad. We'll say it's gender transitioning. This is the old school one. We don't want to call it fornicating. Y'all hear fornicating. You need to stop fornicating. We'll try to call it intimacy. And what he was getting at is that anything that's a sin, we try to pacify. We try to make it seem not as bad. We'll call it a complex. We'll call it a, a disorder. We'll call it a, an addiction. We really want to stay away from that S word of, of sin. And I was like, man, he, he definitely has some points with that. Some very good points. And he, and one of the big ones he brought up is like when pastors speak the truth. Now people will say that it's actually hate speech. They'll just do anything to try and make it seem bad when it should be good and good when it should be bad, especially in the eyes of, of the Lord. Now, something that the enemy always has hijacked or tried to hijack is the rainbow. Like that's another e example where a lot of times people think about the rainbow. They would think homosexuality. They would think gay. But look at what Genesis chapter nine, verse 13 to 15 says The the covenant is actually uh, 13 to 17, but I'm only going to read 13 to 15. It says this. I have set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall serve as a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come out about when I make a cloud appear over the earth, that the rainbow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. So that's the covenant right there. Never again is he going to send a flood to destroy the entire earth and all flesh. That's the covenant. You can read about the rest of the covenant in there. Now, when you think about this, the, the enemy, what does he want to do? His tactic to lie, to lie, lie, lie. It doesn't matter if we lie to ourselves. He just wants us to use lies and try to switch up the name. You ever had met somebody, met some, met some people who like uh, some young ladies like, Ooh, I'm thick. And then you look and you like, I'm not even going to touch that one. OK. Or, you know, sometimes people are like, man, you know, I'm so smooth. And it's like you're really not smooth. You're really manipulative. You're really manipulative. Or, you know, the, the whole I'm a good person. And it's like, well, you're comparing to somebody else. Do you have perfect obedience? Do you meet the standard that's talked about in the Bible? It's like, no, nah, you're not. We're not good. We're not good apart from Christ. That's just one of those things. And especially with those who are trying to live a, a Christian life, a sanctified life, people will look at you and they'll call you this. Now they'd be like, Ooh, you, man, you're boring. You so lame. Like I, I don't want to be around you. You see how they, they switch it up and they call you something else because they don't want you living a, a Christian life. And they want you to feel bad about that. And they want you to join them in doing the, the worldly things. And that's not just the only thing they do that. Think about when a, a husband is, is being great husband is being great to his wife or even a boyfriend is being great to his his girlfriend people would be like "Ooh, you so whipped or they'll be like you're a simp like you need you need to stop and the same thing goes for women when they want to be a great wife or a great girlfriend and they want to be loving and respectful some people will look at them like "Ooh, you being submissive submissive is almost a bad word in a lot of spaces especially in our day and age today and I, I know that's just not the only place where people feel it. I think I feel like parents feel it when they don't bail their kids out and they actually um, make their kids do do some work when they make their kids. Um, they, they don't fight every battle for their kid and they don't worship their kids. All of a sudden, sometimes people might call them a, a bad parent. There are just so many different things where people are you, people are wanting to get to call it a different name to make it appear to be something that is actually not. 
I think friends do that at times, too, where if you don't jump when they want you to jump, some friends will look at you and say, you know what, you're a bad friend. Or, you know, I asked to I asked to I asked you to loan me this and you wouldn't do this. But you know what? If I was in your position, I would do this like one, you probably never going to be in my position. And two, that ain't me being a bad friend. I just, I, I just can't do it right now. And that's just one of those things of where well, you got to look at some people sometimes and be like, oh, so that's what you're calling it? And it, it can be that deception. It can be done in a manipulative way at times. And I think about just in our t- entertainment or in our in our different circles. I think about like a Tim Tebow. So many people be like, they can't stand Tim Tebow, but it's like, why? Because he talked about God a lot and he wore his Christianity on his sleeve. And sometimes people are like, ooh, that's just so corny. I think about Christian rap music or just Christian music in general. So many times people will be like, that's corny. And it's like, well, have you listened to it at all? No, I just can't get down with it. I just can't rock with it. Well, why? I don't know. You don't even know why you call it corny. You don't even know why. And I got some rappers that you should listen to. Go ahead, check out some some Caleb Gordon, some John Keefe, some Hovey. That, that's some good Christian rap. And it's, it's not corny. So don't just call it corny and you really haven't even given it a couple of spins. You want to listen to songs talking about popping perk and doing drugs and getting every woman in the club. Like, that's old. Like, they rapping about the same thing over and over. Rap about something that's good for your soul. Listen to something that's good for your soul. Now, this didn't just this doesn't just happen to us. This actually happened to Jesus as well, where it was like, you tried to call Jesus. What you call Jesus? What? And it it doesn't even make sense. But we're going to look at this. This is in Matthew chapter 12, starting at verse 22. Then they brought him a demon possessed man. They brought Jesus a demon possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? So that's like, could he be the savior? Could he be the Messiah? So some people were ready to call him the Messiah, the savior, the son of David. But look at what some other people were ready to call him. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So they were calling him Satan. They were calling him the devil. Oh, so that's what you're calling him? It goes on to say, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So Jesus is just kind of hitting them with some facts like, bro, y'all don't make any sense. And he goes on to say this. And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do you do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So even with Jesus, the enemy tried to to flip it. The enemy tried to flip it and call him Satan. So some of them like he just drove drove out demons. This is the son of David. And then the enemy's like, no, 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 he could be Satan. It's like he's like, this makes no sense that that wouldn't make sense for Satan to do something like that. Now, this is one of those things where I ask myself this and and I'm going to ask you this same question. What are you willing to be called for God? What are you willing to be called for God? And I'm going to read this passage to you. This is one of those famous passages and explain to you, you know, what God calls us versus what the world wants to call us. Matthew chapter five, verse 38 through 40. You have heard that it was said eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Like, that's crazy right there. A lot of people are like, bro, you smack me. We going to be fighting. We're thro- I'm throwing them. Like, no, I'm not turning the other cheek. You you want to sue me? And I'm supposed to give you my coat? I can't do that. And what would the world tell us? The world would tell us you are being soft if you do this. But w- what is God teaching us with this? God is saying, don't seek revenge. Don't try to go eye for eye. Don't try to go tooth for tooth. 
And you can have the strength to do this my way because of what our Savior has done. Some of you are like, well, what did our Savior do? Mark chapter 15, starting at 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. So you just got to imagine all the blood like gushing down on him and the thorns all in his head and cutting his flesh. And they began to call out to him, hail, king of the Jews. Just disrespectful right there. Again and again, they struck him on the head with the staff and they spit on him. I think spitting is one of the most disrespectful things you can do to a human being. And they spit on Jesus. They spit on him. Fallen on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had knocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. So you got to just to give you some context, give you some things just to think about this. Jesus could have snapped his finger and he could have demolished all of them. He could have had angels come down and he could have just had them wiped out like that. But he didn't do that because there was a plan that the father had that he wanted to execute. And he did it for you and he did it for me because he loves us that much. And that was actually the toughest thing to do. That was one of the most bold things that he could do. He wasn't being soft. He was not being soft at all. Because he was giving up something in order to get everything for us. That's just that's just an awesome blessing for us. Um, sometimes people would tell us that we're too optimistic when we have different things happen in our life, different struggles, different battles. And we they don't want us to have that Romans 8 verse 28 mentality, which is and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to to his purpose people would be like you trusting in this guy still you stupid like nah you you can't be that optimistic you can't be that optimistic look at what's happening but we can trust in the fact that god is going to work out for us because god loves us we've been called according to his purpose for sure and then just another thing just thinking about there will be certain times in our life where if we pass up stuff People will be looking at us crazy. And Genesis chapter 39 is just a great example of that. When Potiphar's wife is throwing it at Joseph and Joseph flees from it. He wants nothing to do. He does not have sex with her. A lot of people would have been like, bro, you got to get the draws. And if you like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do a God way. God, I'm going to do a God's way. People would be like, you're no fun. You're boring. You're lame. I don't want to be around you. You don't know how to have a good time. Like what? Oh, so that's what you calling it? I think a, a, another example that pops out right away is when we think about like a, a David, when David went to go fight Goliath and David defeated Goliath, there were so many things that, that happened prior to that. And the example comes from Samuel, first Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. It says when Eliab, that's David's eldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and asked. Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. So David just came to give his brother some food and he started inquiring like, dude, why is this giant talking so crazy and all your acting so scary? And what did his brother call him? His brother called him conceited and he called him wicked. Why did he call him that? Because David trusted in his God. David trusted in, in in our God and was like, hey, I, I can defeat him, not because I'm so great. I can defeat him because I, my God is so great. And he's given me some victories before. I'm telling you I can do it. So when you have giants in your life and you have the confidence, you have the trust, people are going to be like, where are you getting this confidence and this trust from? They're going to look at you and you know, say, you know what? You're stupid. You're too cocky. You are so unrealistic. But that's the exact same thing that, that David had to go through. So it's like, oh, so that's what you call it now? You're going to call me cocky? You're going to call me stupid? You're going to call me unrealistic? Because you're afraid to go after your giants, but I can go after my giants because my God slays giants. Okay. And at times, people are going to flat out just call us crazy. They will flat out just call us crazy. And I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. When they were told to bow down to this or you're going to die, you're going to get thrown into this fiery furnace. And when we do things that are different than what the world tells us to do because it's outside of God's will, people are going to just find out, look at you like, yeah, you crazy. I, I couldn't have lost my job over that or I couldn't have passed up all the money with that. I would have just went ahead and did something that's outside of, of God's will. 
But that's something that we can remember that just because they call it and switch up the name a little different, we can stay strong because there's been people that have done it. And our and our God is definitely greater than all that. So in this episode of Oh, so that's what you call it. I got to just remember, remind you of the things that God actually calls us and the things that we need to hold true to and wrap our identity up in. So an example, Ephesians 1 verse 7, we are called redeemed and forgiven looking at philippians 3 verse 20 we are called citizens of heaven we have a dual citizenship on this earth but more importantly in heaven god has prepared a room for us looking at ephesians 2 verse 4 and 5 we are called alive and saved alive and saved and romans 8 verse 10 also tells us that in second corinthians 5 verse 21 We are called righteous. We are called holy. We are called perfect because of Jesus's payment that was described in like Mark chapter Mark chapter 15. And to wrap this episode of oh, so that's what you call it. We got to look at this first John three, verse one. Remember that we are called this. See what great love the father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It did not know Jesus. And when the world doesn't know Jesus, they're going to call us all type of things. So we have to remember what Jesus calls us, what our Heavenly Father calls us, what our Holy Spirit equips us with. We are children of God. And this is the non-microwave truth. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Oh, So That's What You Call It. Peace, punch, Captain Crunch. Say no to drugs and yes to Jesus. I am out.